morning. Welcome to Viewpoint, your program of personalities, politicians, and perspectives. We have two outstanding personalities with us this morning, and a perspective maybe most of us don't want to consider, but it's a fact of life, and we have to talk about it. Uh, but before we do that, that uh, deep subject, and Judith Kay will introduce our guest, uh, Folks, we always try to do a kudo on Viewpoint. Uh, some individual or individuals or an organization, somebody's kind of stepped up a little bit. And, uh, I have to mention the uh, Aaron and Joyce Leesman family uh, in conjunction with the fact that I was up very late last night. Uh, the Leesmans have been deeply involved in the honor flight, as is their son Adam, who is in fact charged of the honor flight as they go from Springfield to Washington, D.C. and back. And uh, last night, uh, the plane got held up out there because of the weather and so forth. And as a matter of fact, uh, at 9 o'clock our time, they were still on the tarmac in Washington, D.C., whereupon we decided to pull the plug and come home, thank goodness, or it would have been the wee small hours, I'm certain. But in any event, uh, uh, Aaron and uh, Joyce have been very kind to come by and pick up the old fella. He, they know that I enjoy going down there and supporting the Honor Flight program. And uh, uh, one thing is speaking of support. Uh, Aaron and Joyce, out of their own pocket, buy a bunch of little flags. And they take them down there and put them on tables down there at the Springfield Airport. Donations. No particular set price. And at the end of the evening, they take all that cash money down and turn it into the honor flight. Uh, kudos to the leasemans for that little extra effort. Uh, by the way, are you aware of how the honor flight started? There's quite a history in there. Uh, we're going to talk about Alzheimer's. We really are. <laughs> <laughs> but before I forget, <laughs> I want to tell the, <laughs> both of our listeners out there the history of the honor flight. Uh, right after the uh, World War II memorial was completed, I call it the Bob Dole Memorial because he was instrumental in getting that uh, uh, on, underway and, and completed. And in any event, uh, there was a doctor out in Ohio seeing uh, uh, a patient, and he said to this patient who he knew he was a veteran, Well, George, you're going to get to see your new memorial. George said something, oh God, I can't afford that, or something like that, and it triggered something in that doctor's mind. And he was a member of a flying club out there in Springfield, Ohio. The bottom line is, before it was all said and done after this conversation with this patient, uh, two planes took off with six guys, private planes. And that's, that's the inception of the honor flight. That has morphed into something huge in all of our states, all of our contiguous states. I'm not certain whether Alaska's, I'm, I think so. But in any event, these planes go from the Springfield, Illinois, and the Mobile, Alabama, Mobile, Alabama, and we're all over. And on any given day, there's a plane going to veterans out there uh, seeing their, their memorial. And uh, so, uh, you know, it just shows how one person can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. That triggered a thought in this man's mind, and from there on, exponentially, the honor flight is a huge thing. Which, by the way, did I, met, did I tell you I met uh, Honorable Charles, Honorable, <clears throat> uh, did I tell you I met Senator Charles Grassley out there? No, you didn't. Well, I was wandering around out there like a kid from the country boy, and looking around, and there he stands, and I make him some small talk with him, and all of a sudden he realized I wasn't from Iowa. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> he turned, went, yelling at his, where are those men from Iowa? Oh, God. <laughs> he stands there. I was still talking to him. <laughs> politician, typical politician. <laughs> really? <laughs> All right. Let's get serious this morning. Uh, go ahead and introduce our guest, if you will, my dear. Well, this is a, this is a wonderful. She owns half interest. I have to give her some air time. Yeah. <laughs> this is a wonderful thing for us to talk about, Bill and I being seniors, <laughs> and we're going to talk about Alzheimer's. And Paul Boltman uh, was a professor at Lincoln Christian Church, or Lincoln Christian College, University, for, yeah. uh, for ever so long. Uh, it taught pastoral counseling. And uh, Julie King is the Director of Independent Living Services at Christian Homes. The home. The home. Bowerhead. 
<laughs> referred to gently as the sunset home. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about Alzheimer's. There are so many things as the years go by, and I just having had the big birthday, um, You're am noticing. Now? Yeah, I'm 40 I'm really times two now. <laughs> um, and you notice all kinds of things that are changing, and one of them is certainly your mind and your memory. The kids will be talking to me and I'll say, oh, I did? Or, oh, when? Or, oh, where? And they, they, they're very patient. God love them. But uh, it's kind of embarrassing sometimes. But so many of us face it. And then there's the discussion between is it Alzheimer's or is it just just being forgetful, just a little bit of, just a touch. <laughs> and how, wh what's the diagnosis? How do you know whether it's Alzheimer's or just confusion? <laughs> but before we bring Mr. Boltman on, I have a disclaimer. <laughs> And, it's and that is, Judy and I plan, we, we really work hard to bring you a guest on. We like to plan out about a month or so in advance and so forth. And so and Mr. Boatman's name came up with Judy and I in conversation. I said, that's a good idea. So I called Paul and made arrangements for his appearance here this morning. And about 10 days ago, I saw him at a church supper somewhere. It wasn't a bar, I know that. And... Uh, I said, Paul, we've got you scheduled. Why do we have you scheduled? <laughs> so, yeah. so I thought that Alzheimer's <laughs> was a very appropriate subject for today, in as much as I couldn't remember why I had him booked. I actually did some diagnostic work right at that moment. You you know? did you? <laughs> and what was your conclusion, Doctor? The man's gone. I, I'm sorry, that's confidential. I'm I can't sorry. share that on the air. <laughs> I said, well, it, you know, it's. It's funny at the time you realize your mistake, but it isn't mm -hmm. a funny thing at all. Mm, yeah. Not a bit. Now, let me let me talk about the disease of Alzheimer's. And we people will often ask, is it Alzheimer's or is it dementia? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, dementia is a much broader category. People with Alzheimer's have dementia. Dementia is just that process of not being able to remember things, especially typically short term. Uh, memory. Mm -hmm. You know, you remember things that happened 75 years ago with clarity, mm -hmm. but if it happened seven and a half minutes ago, that's not quite it's so a little sure dicey. <laughs> with, with dementia. Now, that. Alzheimer's is specifically a brain disease mm -hmm. where there are plaques and tangles in the brain that are in process of systematically and in very small increments cutting off blood supply apply to the brain that is gradually reducing Die. the capacity of your mm -hmm. brain. Right, the brain is in process of dying. Mm -hmm. And that can take place over a long period of time. Typically, it's about three to eight years from the time that a diagnosis is made that the brain shuts down so much that the entire body shuts down. That's what we call death. But uh, it varies. I had a student, bright, 62 years old, Alzheimer's diagnosis hit him. He never saw his 64th birthday. Oh my. My father, on the other hand, began showing Alzheimer's symptoms at age 75, and he saw his 91st birthday, and it wasn't actually directly the Alzheimer's that killed him. Some other disease often comes in and mm -hmm. uh, causes the death. But uh, it is a specific disease, and approximately 70% of all people with dementia have dementia because of Alzheimer's. This is what's working on their brain. There are other forms of dementia, but it's the most frequent. But now, dementia it is not a fatal disease, is it? No. But Alzheimer's is. Right. Dementia is a symptom. Right. Okay. Okay. So and any so one of us at any time can have dementia. Mm -hmm. um, I've I've talked to and um, given a little mini lectures and tours to um, the abnormal psych class at Lincoln College and um, I've told them that being dehydrated 
not getting enough rest, um, a strong emotional uh, event uh, such as a death in a family or breaking up with a loved one or whatever it is, all of those things can cause you to have um, dementia, a memory loss. Um, vascular disease can cause dementia, but those types of dementia, as, he, as we've said, are just symptoms of a different problem. Given time or a medication or some good sleep and several glasses of water can change that. Whereas with Alzheimer's, there isn't really anything that's going to change. The fact that you can't remember something. I might not be able to remember your middle name right now, even though I know it, but 10 minutes from now or 10 hours from now when I'm more rested, something will snap and I'll remember it. Someone with Alzheimer's disease is not going to be able to remember that. If you just told me your middle name 10 hours from now, I might go, oh yeah, it's Gloria. Yeah. D does dementia always lead to Alzheimer's? Does Alzheimer's always begin with dementia? Are they that related? Okay, D dementia does not necessarily lead to Alzheimer's, as she's mentioned so many other things. Uh, one of the frequent patterns that will cause people deep anxiety is a urinary tract infection where a person is all of a sudden, look, I can't remember anything and is ready for a major neurological diagnosis and getting the urinary tract infection clears oh, up yeah. that. Mm -hmm. that. The bladder and the brain are. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I, my wife accused me of that many times. Now I, now I know what she means. Yeah. Yeah. Now, but the Alzheimer's it, itself uh, always does, it, that's the symptom that brings it out. There's a chance that if you uh, have Alzheimer's diagnosable, it may well have been at work in your body for several years. And early on, we compensate for it. We uh, work on uh, getting ways around our forgetfulness and couples will be in denial about it. My wife and I were that. My wife had Alzheimer's for a 10 year period before her death and uh, we look back there was at least three years where we were making adjustments, we were doing compensations, we were doing things differently because of this but we weren't ready to accept this and so we didn't get, do a diagnosis mm -hmm. until a very good friend said, Paul, I just spent some time with your wife. What's wrong with her memory? Oh, dear. And I yeah. couldn't deny that. That's yeah. when we went through the diagnostic process. And, and we you know, were she was we very did. open about that. She told me one day, and I remember this very mm -hmm. well. She said, you know, Bill, I have Alzheimer's. And I thought that, I thought that was not strange, but I just was kind of brought up short with the fact that the, an Alzheimer's patient, whom I had known since she was a college kid, you mm -hmm. know, one of our best employees we ever had, and uh, she said, I have Alzheimer's. Well, I wasn't sure how to handle that. You know, she never told me about that because she didn't remember having told you about uh, that. Well, that's but that yeah. was a policy we had early on to be open. It's not something we're ashamed of. Yeah, it's not a result of years of riotous living. No, uh, no, it's, it's not. simply had come upon us, and um, so by being open with it, she enabled others to have conversation with her about it, and it's a part of who she was for that ten-year period. Now, dementia and or Alzheimer's, they are their cousins. Dementia is a symptom of Alzheimer's. Right. Now, what I wanted to ask is, is it always at a, a, a middle age and, and upward, or can younger people, say in their 20s or 30s, come up with dementia? Okay, the earlier the age, the less likely that it will happen, but uh, yes, the other yeah. younger yes. people for a variety of reasons. A head injury is a very yes. common Well, we have one at the, at, at the home, uh, Jules, and uh, you know, she's been bad for a number of years and she's a very young lady. Mm -hmm. Well, she's in her 60s now, for goodness sake. Mm -hmm. Does it follow in families at all? There's a tendency. It's not absolute in families. There are some families that have, there's a gene that gives a pr mm -hmm. genetic predisposition to Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. 
But there are people who have that gene who never develop Alzheimer's symptoms, and there are many other people who don't have that gene who do, do develop. Mm -hmm. There's just a certain tendency. If your father and your grandfather both had Alzheimer's, as mine did, by the way, then you have a higher probability than average. Are people loath to find out actually that it is Alzheimer's? Do they just uh, say that I'm having a little trouble remembering? <laughs> right. we, we have an Alzheimer's support group yes. that Julie and I uh, work with in Lincoln at the Oasis the third Tuesday oh, of nice. each month. As I recall, that was just yesterday. It was just yesterday. <laughs> As a matter of fact. As a matter of fact. And, and people will often come to that because they've just gotten a diagnosis and they're fearful. They walk in with trepidation. What's yes. it going to like be like? And what they find there is a group who can talk about it, not afraid of, of it, and there's a kind of a relaxing, we can be at home, mm -hmm. but nobody wants to have this diagnosis. Would it be safe to say, Paul, that if we had our, all, all had our druthers, we'd rather come up with something else, uh, even a cancer? Sure. And that's a, that's a strong statement. but Right, uh, because, well, let me comment on that, Bill. Ed. It's a it's a good uh, observation. Most of us develop in our mind the image of that person who's in a fetal position with jaw gape, staring straight at the ceiling and unresponsive to anything around him. Yeah. There are people who get to that end stage Alzheimer's, but there's a long period in between where you have a limitation mainly on what you can remember and it gets pretty frustrating. Did I just tell you that? Did yes. you just tell me that again? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was that that you were telling me? And so I, where, where it really goes on endlessly a dozen, 15 times to say what time we have to leave to be at the radio station this morning. Yeah. But uh, if you can work with it, you can actually have a period of significant time of enjoyment. We still, during my wife's Alzheimer's, we still spent a lot of time with our grandkids. We did cross-country trips. Mm -hmm. We, uh, you know, mm -hmm. we had to plan a different schedule. Mm -hmm. We didn't expect the same pressure to, to be able to meet the same pressures, but we had joy. Are there personality traits that that might be a factor ever. For instance, if if it's real easy for you to focus mm -hmm. on what we're doing right now, mm -hmm. would you be more apt to avoid dementia or Alzheimer's? Or if you're just kind of a harebrained like me, are you doomed? <laughs> There's been a lot of research for a long time trying to find commonality, you know, trying to find triggers, trying yes. to... There is one that they have looked at that um, folks who have kind of a depressive personality, mm -hmm. um, perhaps they do have a, a clinical diagnosis of depression, are more likely to develop Alzheimer's than someone like the five of us in this room who are, generally speaking, um, very positive, um, light-hearted, always looking for the good. Um, there tends to be a fewer of us that would develop dementia because um, we keep our our brains healthy with laughter and 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 socialization and community. Um, it's it's not a huge gap, but they're they are finding that that gap between people with with positive outlooks versus people with more of a depressive uh, issue. It's interesting that these things are coming to to light because I think we've treated this uh, almost inevitability uh, you, as you grow older is <laughs> um, some something to be ashamed of or or not talked about and and so we 
it just kind of tiptoe around mm -hmm. it. But now, I, you know, given the world that we're living in right now where everybody is loud and proud about absolutely <laughs> everything, <laughs> well, there's, <that. laughs> there's a society for mismatched socks. I mean, we have something for everyone these days. <laughs> yeah. So it has made it much easier for people with diseases that we kept in the closet before yeah. are out there and people are more comfortable about talking about it and there's something very freeing about that. Um, you're, you're not necessarily going to be less afraid to ask the doctor, do you think I have Alzheimer's? Mm -hmm. Nobody wants a bad diagnosis. Bill, Bill said that himself. But um, because there's so much research that um, the statistics, um, I've got one right here. This is the difference between deaths between 2000 and 2017 of heart disease have gone down by 9%. Mm -hmm. However, deaths with association to Alzheimer's disease have increased by 145 percent. Holy Friday. Yeah, so you know you would rather have him say you have heart disease than have him say you have Alzheimer's because yeah. there's still not, there's still all these trials but nothing that they can say this works, this makes a difference. There is you know, no uh, cure right. right now. And I would much rather know that I might have a cure than there's no chance of a cure. So, well, what what symptom, what component of Alzheimer's is it that causes the death? I mean, I I think of it as just not being able to remember, severely not being able to remember. But but why would that cause death? Because the body stops remembering how to do things. The brain makes everything. We start with um, one of the things that I've, I first noticed when I started working with uh, people with dementia as it advanced is um, um, they start to forget how to walk. And I called it scissor walking. The feet started to come in and actually you could step on your own foot because you don't quite remember how to place your feet. So that was one of the first things that I saw. This is moving to the end stage. Yes, right? yeah. Now, so you, know, you folks, get a gait disturbance. Out there in this great mystery beyond, out there in what we call the airwaves, we have some sponsors that are just chomping at the bit, <laughs> and they may and they may think that here in this studio we have five people with collective amnesia, <laughs> and they've forgotten it. And we have it, and Mr. Rice is going to solve that problem right now. Right back live in the studios here, WLCN 96.3 on that magical dial. The program this morning is Viewpoint every Wednesday morning, 0800 hours to uh, oh, 815. I'm sorry about that. Dementia just set in uh, uh, to 0900 hours. Our uh, guest this morning, uh, uh, a subject that uh, it's strange to all of us if we're not directly associated with it. Dementia and Alzheimer's. Uh, it's hard for a person who doesn't know anything about it to even try to, to get into a conversation because we're, we're so lacking in knowledge about and, and now Julie King works with folks in, in her professional capacity uh, at the Christian homes that uh, have one or the other uh, Mr. Paul Boltman is uh, self-studied I think mostly uh, professionally uh, counseling and uh, experienced it himself with his lovely wife Mary who uh, I always said and I say again on the air she's one of the best employees Gossett's ever had uh, she was a neat lady we were talking about the the uh, things that are available for people who are grasping it where do I go uh, how do I how do I handle this problem Aunt Mary or, or mom as so the case may be so go ahead Julie you have some some uh, uh, outside programs that are available to families um, yes we have the Alzheimer support group which we were talking about um, and we did want to mention that we are planning um, the Alzheimer's memory walk which is the last uh, Saturday in September it's the 28th 
and it'll be out at the Oasis Senior Center. Um, people can form teams and just raise funds. The walk is is the actual walk around the track at the Oasis is um, uh, you don't necessarily have to do that. I mean, if you have mobility issues, but you want to raise funds to help with the research mm -hmm. to help try to find a cure uh, or at least a treatment for Alzheimer's, um, Lincoln is having its second walk. We had our first one last year and, and did far better than we expected. Um, so this year, if you would like to help raise funds for Alzheimer's research. You can form a team. Uh, you can go online or you can call the Oasis and they'll tell you how to make a team. Um, and then just raise as many funds as you possibly can. We're very excited. Last year, Lincoln College athletes put on their purple because purple is the color for Alzheimer's awareness. Oh, and because Lincoln College, the links are purple in yeah. their uniforms. They ran from Lincoln College all the way out to the Oasis. It was wonderful. Then they hit the track and they ran all the way around the Oasis with this big purple flag just Army. to show support. Bless their hearts. Yeah, it was wonderful. And we were able to educate them about why they ran, uh, which was significant. And then well, we found out several the students' young kids, grandparents had college Alzheimer's. College-age kids. You know, the subject matter in and of itself is kind of a dreaded thing conversationally because most of us have no cognizance at all. All we know is that's a big word. And uh, the, the folks act funny out there. Well, it's not a funny subject at all. We older people, like an old guy I know, they try to <laughs> try to pass it off. Uh, well, there it is again. I've got Alzheimer's. Well, that's not a funny subject. That's not even a funny comment. Mm -hmm. So those of us who are, want to do that uh, ought to clean up our act a little bit. You mentioned that uh, the research has brought about some medicines yes. that are able to alleviate or yes, and there's constantly. Uh, Mary was took part in three um, blind studies of of medications that they were wanting to try. Uh -huh. um, there, oh, there really is good. some, uh, there's a lot of work being done in this, just like there was a lot of work being done for polio before finally yes. yeah. right mm -hmm. there and so on. We can remember those yeah. days. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes, yes, we can. <laughs> Absolutely. But the, um, what, so far, while there's no cure that has been found, there are meds that can alleviate the symptoms a bit. Uh, there's an Aricept and the uh, generics of that that can enable the mind to do better uh, remembering it does not cure the disease no, no. but at least for this moment the memory is a little bit better mm -hmm. and there's uh, other things you know that can be done in a patch form there are some other meds that compensate for that but they're well studied that alleviate the symptoms and there's also just the general care and treatment to, and awareness, people who've been in it in conversation with the doctors, all the things that they can do to keep their mind active, whether it being Sudoku or crossword puzzles mm -hmm. or things like that. We don't recommend they go on Jeopardy. That's not a good <laughs> better. But uh, things that keep the mind active, uh, they can do that. There's also an observation, incidentally, that your uh, exercise and your diet can have some influence mm -hmm. because the things, the plaques and tangles in the brain are very similar to what goes on in the problems in the heart where the, uh, the vessels get blocked up and so on mm -hmm. so that healthy eating, healthy exercise, mm -hmm. keeping your mind going, that can at least push it back and one of the reasons we're having such an epidemic there are 5.7 million people who have Alzheimer's right now probably 600 people in Logan County alone mm -hmm. who My have word. Alzheimer's the, the, yes, Julie. the last commercial break that we took how long did that take about three minutes about three, three minutes. minutes every 65 seconds someone else gets a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So we had three people get diagnosed in the time it took you to take a break and come back. That's significant. 
Yeah. That's a frightening, that's a frightening mm -hmm. statistic. One of the reasons we're getting it so frequently now is it does tend to be a disease of older age. While there are younger people who get it, it tends toward older age. And we've made such good progress on so many other diseases that we're living long enough mm -hmm. oh, yeah. to have this number. Uh, anticipate that by uh, the middle of this century there will be over 15 million people with Alzheimer's. Uh, it's just a really, it's, really uh, poor. Worst of it is, some of them are run, running around Washington, D.C. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm a little hesitant to get into that topic because <laughs> it is. Now, there comes a time in a family when Alzheimer's makes itself known, and uh, the natural bent is to keep our family at home as long as we can, mm -hmm. number one, for economic reasons, if no other. Mm -hmm. Because the e economics of it are, are fearful, yeah. just fearful. There comes a time when the family has to make a decision. What do they do then, Julie, and, and where, where do they go? It depends on where their loved one is in the disease process. Mm -hmm. You can start with assisted living. and. Um, uh, for instance, here in Lincoln, we have Copper Creek, and Copper Creek is dementia-specific assisted living care. Oh. So um, the way they run their program, the way their building is laid out, everything is geared towards being as successful as you can possibly be in and as independent as you can still remain being, but with the limitation of your memory. Then from assisted living, um, then you would as the disease progresses, if it progresses mm -hmm. to its natural end, mm -hmm. then you would go into a, a nursing home, nursing center of some kind, where you would get 24-hour care, medications, um, but you still want to look for something. I would encourage a family to look for something that is socially based and is very active. You keep bringing up this socialization yes. issue. Apparently, that's a big component. It absolutely is. Um, there's a couple of, of different countries. Japan is one, and I think Sweden is another, where they built a village, an entire village. It's got shops, it's got a bowling alley, it's got a church. It looks like a little Lincoln, okay? Uh -huh. Or let's say we took uh, the former developmental center, turned it into a little village. Everyone that works there, the butcher, is actually an employee who understands dementia. Mm -hmm. And so um, their neighbor is someone with dementia. And um, then the caregiver is one of their neighbors. And so they would come and say, Gloria, let's go get some groceries, shall we? And they would walk to the grocery store and they would get the groceries that they need. It's all it's all the community. I mean, it, it's truly, mm -hmm. it is an Alzheimer's community. A real thing. Yes, it would be like going to a nursing center, except it is designed to mirror life. And the people that live there are staying, they're maintaining, I guess I want to say, is they're maintaining their cognitive abilities longer because it mirrors what they're used to doing but the people that work there have an understanding of the disease process and they know how to help them navigate it safely. I, I think it's amazing. A difficult part of this disease comes to my mind. Your brain is affected so it's sick. Mm -hmm. uh, the personalities in, get involved there. Somebody who's rather placid can suddenly become combative. Does that enter into the picture at all? It, it may. It can. Probably not, a little more with some of the other dementias than with Alzheimer's, but it can. It, it can take away the filters that you normally have. Mm -hmm. When you hear a sweet little old lady who taught the second grade Sunday school class at church <laughs> who sounds like she's a sailor who's <laughs> a drunken, <laughs> uh, yeah. something's gone on. The filter has been taken I've away. I've only experienced that at the Christian homes <laughs> way back when I was working on their window treatment. <laughs> okay. Was that from Julie? <laughs> okay. uh, no. I have Alzheimer's. I've forgotten. All right. Good. Good but seriously, that, you know, that, that, that's, we can make light of that. And it is a funny thing. 
but Aunt Mary, who was sainted from the word go, mm -hmm. suddenly she's like a sailor, as you suggest. Right. And, it and is that just comes from nowhere. That's mm -hmm. the thing. It's not a given, though. Mm -hmm. um, right. it, it, again, it is so individual. Um, if, if Judy and I both had dementia of the Alzheimer's type, mm -hmm. Judy may never experience those symptoms at all. Um, whereas I might, um, and it's just it—it's a f luck of the draw, really. One yeah. of the truisms that the people in neurology say: when you've seen one case of Alzheimer's, you've seen one case of <laughs> Alzheimer's, yes. and not there. Yes. A lot of variation. So what I had, I would encourage people who have a loved one that has Alzheimer's disease: don't compare them to anyone else. They are who they are. Take they're experiencing down, what they're <laughs> experiencing, and it's very unique to them. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, I think one of the most important things that I can tell anyone is, um, as long as you remember who they are, that's all that's important. Well, the worst one, by, the worst byproduct, insofar as I can tell, is when a person becomes vegetative. Mm -hmm. That, that's hard in any that disease. To me is, uh, that, that's the bottom of the pits. Right, and that is it's not what I'd call rare, but it is not characteristic. My wife, whom you know so well, Bill, uh, in her, the last four months of her life, a congestive heart failure that related to a heart problem that had been back 25 years earlier, uh -huh. congestive heart failure came on, and over a four-month period, her health declined rapidly, and she died from congestive heart failure. Now, if it were not for the Alzheimer's, her immune system might have been stronger, other things might have kicked in to help her body fight mm -hmm. that off more effectively. Mm -hmm. But she never reached that vegetative state. So that... There's a blessing to that. Mm -hmm. There, there yeah. was. Her yeah. last words to me, she looked up and she said to me, it's okay. And she seemed relaxed and it took me about 15 seconds to realize she just left and she never had pain and did not have that dark period of vegetation. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, God. Yeah. Now, is that uh, more the, the general thing? But oftentimes, are people not afraid or, or uh, in pain? As they leave, yeah, with the Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's typically does not produce any pain, mm -hmm. right? Uh huh. Well, that's a blessing. I mean, mm -hmm. they've already had enough trauma mm -hmm. <laughs> with it. Do you have uh, percentage-wise uh, uh, your residents of the home, the Christian, would say, "By the way, I got to." Did I, did I get two seconds to give him a little plug? It's your show. You get to do whatever you want. <laughs> He's in control. We've learned that a long time ago. <laughs> well, we're very happy campers out there at the home. Uh, the uh, statistics. Do you have a handle on this percentage of folks who have that, for want of a better word, disease? Is, can we call Alzheimer's a disease? Alzheimer's is it a is. disease. Yeah. It's a disease okay. of the brain. All mm -hmm. right. Uh, d do you have a percentage uh, out there at the home? Uh, with any with any nursing home per se in that broad category? Right. They have certain percentage of folks who have cancer or a certain percentage who have Alzheimer's. Sure. But that requires special treatment. It does. Um, and that's why you have that wing. That's why there. we have that wing. Twenty-five beds of of dementia care specific, mm -hmm. and anyone who works on that floor has to have twelve hours of specialized training, and then anyone who enters that floor as an employee has to have at least four hours of training. So the housekeeper has to know how to redirect someone if, if they're exit seeking. Um, the maintenance man needs to know how to talk to somebody who is um, looking for their mom or looking for their dad or wanting to leave because the kids are going to be home soon. I need to go. They're going to be home and they're going to wonder where I am. So 
no matter what level that employee is, that staff person, that associate, needs to know how to meet that person where they are. And What an important uh, requirement for employment. Yes. But, you know, that's an important requirement for us just to walk this earth, I think. Really? If we can just be willing to figure out where people are in that moment. Um, why, why does your mind do these things to you? I can tell you, I remember very well when my grandmother told me about this. And then I can't remember whether I had breakfast or not. <laughs> That's the short-term memory, memory thing. Yeah. And that, by the way, is the reason you'll always hear when you people are talking about how to deal with a person with Alzheimer's, don't argue with them. The reason is that arguing in our family, arguing was a, a delightful way of relating. We did forensic <laughs> discussions in order to establish the truth. But when you're arguing with a person who has Alzheimer's, if you establish that you are very clearly right, mm -hmm. they forget it, they cannot, uh, it, it won't stick. It's like the brain has Teflon and the information mm -hmm. won't take. That's so, a good analogy. So you establish the truth, what you think is the truth, and it's gone. It never takes. So it's just futile and it's frustrating and it ends up just souring the atmosphere. Would you come to 204 North Evans for a lecture on that? Yeah. I'll explain. I have, I have a recipient for you. I'll explain to Gene. Bill is always right. So just accept just that. There you go. I like that theory. Uh, on a lighter note, real quickly, um, years back I was at the front door of 7th Street there uh, before the remodeling and all, putting up a window treatment. And this gal came along who was a dear friend of our family. She marched through there, and of course the bells went on. So the nurse came running, come on, so and so, come, you go with me. And she says, oh, you're always trying to take me somewhere. <laughs> and stomp off. So I went, climbed off my ladder, and we told Tim, I said, you got a gym here. <laughs> oh, dear. We appreciate very much uh, Julie King, uh, representing Christian Holmes, uh, who has uh, do a tremendous job in, in caring for people. Uh, some of us are beyond the pall. I mean, it is what it is, and we just have to work with it on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Boatman, who is not only a, a studied expert on that, he walked the walk, so he's qualified yeah. to talk the talk. Go ahead, Julie. Speaking of talking the talk, I just want to say if anybody would ever like Paul and I to come and talk to their group at length about anything that we've discussed today, we would be happy to do that. That's kind and of our mission. And they would contact you by calling Julie King. I'll try to get your phone free, uh, Paul, uh, at Christian Nursing Home. Uh huh. Seven three two five zero one three. Very important subject. Uh, mm -hmm. Could be a huge a huge bull off somebody's shoulders to be able to just talk about their problems that, that they mm -hmm. are and they don't know what the heck to do with them thank you very much for viewpoint oh, I just uh, always close with uh, my clothes that I came up with not too long ago be the reason somebody smiled today thank you very much thank you.